Ed? Amen. Well, it seems like an eternity to me that we started the series on Psalms. Not the first one I did. I've had uh, several different messages on particular Psalms. It was called From Despair to Delight. This is actually a study in the entire book of Psalms. And so we started, I have here June 23rd. But with all the things that were going on, we, we never got to finish the introduction. So I'm not even going to get into uh, Psalm 1, which I have right here. So let's see how it goes. We have about 40 minutes, and uh, I'll try not to bore you to death. But just a quick review. Uh, there's a lot of things I want to go through in here just to make you appreciate. This is a book, a compassionate book uh, that gets to the heart of the issue of life. Things in life, the struggles and uh, the victories, of course, and the praises, but so many things. We said, first of all, we looked at the author. Remember, David wrote 73 of the inspired Psalms. Uh, we have also Asaph, A-S-A-P-H, one of the chief musicians and director of David's choir. He wrote 12 Psalms. The sons of Korah wrote 10 Psalms. Solomon, remember, wrote Psalm 72 and 127. Moses wrote Psalm 90 during Israel's 40 years of wandering. A man named He-Man, he must have been quite a guy, maybe one of these kind of guys. <laughs> he was the second of David's chief musicians beside Asaph. He penned Psalm 88. Uh, and seventh and last that they know of was a man named Ethan wrote Psalm 89. So we, we look at, again, David wrote the majority, the vast majority. Uh, remember, we said that these 150 psalms are divided, again, into five books. All right, you can look at each of these as five books. We have Psalm 1 through 41 is book 1. Psalm 42 to 72 is book 2. Psalm 73 to 89 is book 3. Psalm 90 to 106 is book 4. And then Psalm 107 to 150 is book 5. And they say that these five books correspond to the five books, the first five books of the Bible. We call that what? The Pentateuch that were written by Moses. In other words, book one corresponds to Genesis, book two to Exodus, and so on, book five to Deuteronomy. Um, great English preacher J. Sidlow Baxter said this. He said, the first group of books, the one that corresponds to Genesis, has much to say about man. The second group corresponds to Exodus, much to say about deliverance. It goes along with that message. The third book of Psalms corresponding with Leviticus, has its emphasis upon the sanctuary. The fourth group, corresponding with Numbers, talks about the coming kingdom. And then the fifth and last group corresponds to Deuteronomy, as much to say about faithfulness of God, the word of God, and then the longest of all Psalms, 119, has the theme about the written word of God. And each of these five books that we looked at just now conclude with a doxology, which is just an outburst of praise and glory to God. Of course, Psalm 150, the very last psalm, has that doxology at the, at the end. This being it's the last psalm. If you look at Psalm 150, verse 1 through 6, says, Praise ye the Lord. It's a psalm of praise, uh, a doxology. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Brother Lloyd, imagine. <laughs> Praise him with the psaltery and harp. I, I put down psaltery and pepper. Yeah. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. And praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. And then concludes, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, and then praise ye the Lord. He began with praise ye the Lord. It ends with praise ye the Lord. And this is what it's all about, pretty much, the Psalms. You know, certain sections of the Psalms are grouped together uh, by themes and categories. And this is all review. There's six categories. Remember, we're not going to go through all of it and that take too long. Praise, Psalms of lament, third, kingdom, fourth, penitent or confession, fifth, remember, imprecatory Psalms. These are the ones where they're actually crying out to God to take care of their enemies, you know, cursing and judgment upon the enemies. And then last, is thanksgiving, psalms of thanksgiving. We looked at all that, and uh, this is new. There's the musical terms used in many of the psalms. Now, you know, a lot of people today will say, well, you know, the New Testament doesn't mention too much about music, so there's some churches that have no musical instruments. You know, there's different denominations like that. There's so many terms regarding music in the psalms. 
where it says in the Psalms, a lot of times you'll say, to the chief musician. Oh, he's, it's, it meant that these Psalms that say that were used in the worship of the temple to sing praises. These, these were songs that were sung. Uh, another example, I can't give you all of them, there's so many words. A word that you'll see in Psalm 46 says, Alamoth, A-L-A-M-O-T-H. That was to be sung, that meant that psalm by a female with a high-pitched voice. That's what it meant, all right? Uh, another word where you see masculine, Psalm, the 32nd Psalm, M-A-S-C-H-I-L, masculine. That means that psalm was for teaching and instruction, all right? Again, to be sung, it was to be sung with that idea in mind. Uh, you could see a psalm that said, like Psalm 3, has mizmor in the front, M-I-Z-M-O-R. That means it was to be accompanied by musical instruments, all right? Uh, they had psalms that were, Psalm 4, negamoth. Neganoth was a psalm to be accompanied by stringed instruments, particular instruments. Nehaloth, Psalm 5, was wind instruments or flutes. Uh, a lot of times in the psalms you'll see a word, selah, S-E-L-A-H. You know what I, That means to pause or a musical interlude for the purpose of meditation. That people, when they sung that first part and it said, selah, stop, we're going to talk about it, think about it, and meditate on what we just sang. Um, a shemineth, which was in Psalm 6, means the eighth and refers to the octave which was to be performed. It could refer, they say, to an eight-stringed instrument. Some Bible scholars believe that the term shemineth was a, in contrast to alamoth, the one we talked about earlier on, was a female voice. Well, shemineth was to be sung by a male with a low-pitched voice. <laughs> Shigeon was uh, a word to be sung, a song, Psalm 7, with intense emotion, all right? I don't know if you ever heard Pavarotti, the Italian tenor who's, who's dead now, but when he sang, he sang with, with passion. You know, you could see the passion in his body language, in his facial expressions, in his voice. That's what that word Shigeon means in Psalm 7. Shoshanamon is uh, Psalm 45, meant lilies, that this song was to be formed in the spring, usually at the feast of the Passover. And so, as you can see, many of these psalms were for praise. And then the last Psalm 86, there was a word, a musical word called tefillah, and it means that that psalm was a prayerful psalm. So, so much uh, in these psalms it had a message, of course, but it was to be a song a message in the song. In fact, any song that's sung should have a message in it. Amen? We're not going to just sing songs. We're not here to perform and, and be on a stage that we're, we're, we're voting on who the best singer is. It's, we're songs of praise, songs with doctrine, songs with a biblical message in it. Amen? Date written. Do you know when the Psalms were written? A long time ago, you could say, and you'd be correct. The majority of the inspired Psalms you have in your Bible were written during the time of the kings. They believe between 2 Samuel and 1 Kings, over a 100-year period from 1030 B.C. to 930 B.C. Uh, obviously, they say the one Psalm Moses wrote was written during his lifetime, and next to Job, that psalm is to be believed to be the oldest portion of our Bible, all right? The Psalm of Moses and the book of Job. The time of the writing of many of the psalms, though, cannot be positively established. Like Psalm 137, was probably written during the Babylonian exile, but they didn't know the exact year. Other Psalms, like Psalm 126, Psalm 147, appear to have been penned after the Jews were released from Babylon. They were, again, praising and thanking God for his working in their lives. Now, we don't know how and for certain when the book of Psalms, as you have it today, was compiled and put together. Like many of our songbooks, think of the book of Psalms like a hymnal that happens to be in our Bible. Just like the hymnals and the songbooks we have today, it was revised over time until it is assembled and completed Psalm was, uh, Psalms exactly as God's Spirit would have. We believe the Bible is inspired, amen, and it's been preserved, it's infallible, and God superintended, just like we talked about today in Sunday school with history, God's hand was in it. It's His Word. And He moved upon men to recognize those Psalms, those songs, that he felt would be included in the canon of Scripture and in the book of Psalms. So remember that. It's reasonable to conclude that David compiled the Psalms before and during his lifetime. So many of them were done by him. And many trustworthy Bible scholars believe the inspired collection that we call the book of Psalms was completed by Ezra and Nehemiah when they restored worship in Jerusalem. Remember, after return from the captivity, if you read Nehemiah chapter 8, 
It's like a, a revival. We talk about the songs we sung tonight. The Jews were back in Israel, remember, from the captivity, and they started worship again. And, and remember, they were reading the Word of God for hours and hours, and the people were crying, and they said, we're going to do what the Bible says, what the Word of God says, and it was a great revival. And so a lot of that uh, was, was uh, brought about and completed, way they believe, Bible scholars, by the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, when J Jerusalem had restored worship. Can you imagine that the Jews in captivity could not do these things? Uh, they could do them privately, but not corporately as a group or as a church. We, we sing here tonight these songs, you know, and the words, like Brother John said, don't just sing the tune and the melody, but think about the words there about salvation. And again, the songs with doctrinal meaning. I don't know about you, but, you know, you can get very excited, almost like when somebody preaches something in the Bible and you say, amen, and you're singing these words, uh, it should do the same thing. The purpose, several purposes this was written. Historically, psalms were compiled to provide a hymnal. Yes, a hymnal for the Jewish people to worship. The psalms teach the importance of singing as well as to the experience of God's people as you walk through everyday life, the things that happen, the, the heart issues of life. You know, Moses wrote songs for the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness, as they were going through that desert for so many years singing. David wrote songs for the people as they worshiped there in Jerusalem. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, which was originally a Passover meal, he and the disciples sang a hymn before they left, and that's in Matthew 26. Paul instructed the church in Ephesians 5, what? To sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When God's Spirit pulled back the veil that separates this dimension we live in from heaven, John in the Revelation saw God's people singing new songs of praise to the Lamb, Revelation 5, 9 and Revelation chapter 14. Additionally, John witnessed the singing of old songs, the song of Moses, one of the oldest recorded in Scripture in Exodus 15, and he also saw them singing the Song of the Lamb, which, guess what? Psalm 22 and Psalm 92. Where did he see that? Revelation 15, 3. So these are things. John saw, again, he was allowed to, to see into the future. They were singing the Psalms. We are going to be singing the Psalms in heaven. Amen? So that's the historical purpose, all right? Again, a, a hymnal for the Jews. And then, again, we're, we're, to me, I believe we're commanded Paul instructed the church in Ephesians, be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, right? But be filled with the Spirit. And he says, singing to yourself psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So music is, is a big part. Not the most important part is the preaching of the Word, but it's a big part of, of our worship. The doctrinal purpose is the Jewish people sang their doctrine. Psalms take the basic themes of Old Testament theology and they're turned into a song. The doctrines of God, his righteousness, his justice, his faithfulness, his mercy, his love, creation, man, God's covenant with man, God's redemption, his word, all those were to be sung. The Psalms were written and compiled to teach us to praise God throughout every circumstance in life, good and bad. <laughs> the Hebrew title of the book, Telhilim, means praises. The Psalms teach us to praise God in every occasion joy and sorrow, victory and defeat, trouble and triumph, burden and blessing. Can you do that? This is reflected by the different types of psalms. The psalms are model prayers that we sing, examples from which we can learn. First, you have the liberty to empty your hearts to the throne of God. You know, Hebrews tells us we can come boldly to the throne of grace to get help in time of need. They did that, again, in the Old Testament by singing words of praise and by their heavy hearts a lot of times crying out to God. Psalms are brutally honest, <laughs> like blazing lava shooting out of a volcano. They erupt with raw emotion. Every emotion of the human soul is found in Psalms. Good and what we could say bad. Secondly, problems turn to praise in the Psalms. Many of the Psalms, especially David's, they have a pattern. We'll see that as we study them. They begin with problems, but they end with praise. <laughs> it's good, right? And a number of these prayer resulted from the solving of the problem and the changing of circumstances, and then in the end, praise to God. In the midst of problems, trials, troubles, none of us have that. I know that. Sufferings, distresses. We can have jubilant hearts that sing praise 
to the Lord. The message of the book of Psalms is we can cry out to God about anything and everything. And when we do, fear turns to faith, sorrow to joy, worry turns to peace. That's the effect it should have on us. Another uh, reason is the Christ-centered purpose, one of the many purposes for the Psalms. After Jesus' resurrection, he opened the understanding of disciples to the things which were written in the Psalms concerning him. Look at Luke, don't look at it now, 2444. All right, Jesus opened their understanding by quoting from the Psalms, which were written about him. The Psalms abound, by the way, with prophecies concerning Christ. It refers particularly to Christ, referred to as these are called messianic Psalms. Other things are, are sang is the Messiah's deity, his life, his obedience, his betrayal, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, all thousands of years before it happened in the Psalms. These prophecies will be identified and discussed later, but the key Messianic Psalms are Psalm 2, speak of Christ's future kingship, Psalm 22, which prophesy about the Savior's death in startling detail, and Psalm 110, which announces lordship and priesthood. So these are, again, things... I, I, we believe when they were writing, they were inspired writers. They didn't even know exactly what they were writing. They were just the human penmen that God used. And the Psalms are great songs. We have a few special features, and then I think we, we'll go into Psalm 1. We have plenty of time. Psalms is a called also the great book of praise to God. <laughs> the Hebrew title of the book means praises, and it teaches us to praise God. Again, we said every circumstance in life. Number two, Psalms is also known as the great book of desperate pleas to God. Not please may I, but please, P-L-E-A-S. And crying out. David, many times, cried out to God in desperate need. These cries of distress were often blunt, honest, unrestrained, teaching us today that we can speak to God freely and without fear. Third, the Psalms is a great book that teaches us to trust and take refuge in the Lord. In every troubling situation, we can find Shelter, safety, and security in God. Fourth, it's known as the great book that reveals the painful consequences of sin. You know, David, his broken heart through the sin of seen in several of his psalms, reminding us sin carries a price and consequences. Fifth, the great book of Psalms shows us how to approach God in times of agony and suffering. Throughout Psalms, we're exposed not only to David's suffering, but to the future suffering of Christ is mentioned there as well. Sixth, it's the great book that gives us hope in life's darkest hours. I don't care what you're going through, what struggles, what trials, what tribulations. The Psalms can be read and again, be being thought of again as a, as a song and a hymn of crying out to God and praising God. Seventh, the book teaches us how we can trust God when facing opposition and enemies. Many of the Psalms were written uh, when the Jews and David were facing great oppression and, and fear for their lives and cried out to God for help and refuge. Eighth, the Psalms, the great book that includes the best loved chapter of the Bible, that is the 23rd Psalm. And then ninth and last, Psalms is the great book most frequently quoted or referred to by none other than our Lord Jesus Christ more than any other book. And so if Jesus thought it was vital and important to know and sing and teach the Psalms, we should do that as well, and we will. All right, let's spend a few minutes here. I'm not going to be able probably to do the whole lesson I have, but let's go to Psalm 1, the very first one, and uh, we'll take a look at that for a few minutes before we, we close tonight. We used to sing this uh, to the kids, uh, especially verses 1 through 3. You say, what about 4 through 6? Well, we, we never put that to music. <laughs> Psalm number 1, verses 1 through 3, we used to sing. This is called How to Be Happy and Blessed in Life, Psalm number 1. Why don't we um, read it together out loud, all six verses. It's short. Psalm number 1, starting with verse 1, all together, all right? Let's say it together. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in a season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth 
shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Very clear. The Declaration of Independence proclaims, we, we, we pretty much know that, right? We should. God has endowed all men with inalienable rights of what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Sometimes, sadly, though, the pursuit of happiness is just the one that most of us and most people want to look for. I want to just be happy. I want to give me anything I can that makes me happy. And we squander time and money and energy and make poor choices, often ruining our lives, searching for the treasure, you know, the treasure at the end of the rainbow in all the wrong places. And so the question is this, where then can true happiness be found. <laughs> the simple and powerful truth in God's Word, and especially here in Psalm 1, true happiness is a gift of God. It's one of His special blessings to us. This gift is ours <laughs> if we are rightly related to Him and we walk in obedience to His commands. I don't know anybody who would say, "Yeah, I don't want to be happy. I'm just happy to be miserable the rest of my life. <laughs> Many commentators of the Bible believe that this Psalm 1 was purposely written as an introduction to the entire 150, this collection uh, that was inspired. The following about this is it teaches us how to experience God's blessings. We're going to learn about that. It emphasizes God's Word. It paints a picture of two men. We saw it already, the godly and the ungodly, those who follow sharply different ways of life, men with distinctly different endings and futures, all here in these short six verses. Have you ever heard of a man called Warren Wiersbe? You've heard of him, I'm sure. Well, Bible teacher and commentator Warren Wiersbe said, Psalm 1 presents two ways, two choices here, the way of blessing and the way of judgment. It's like choosing uh, in a fork in the road, which way you're going to take. And it was the choice Israel, again, Psalms written, for the nation of Israel, but of course it's in our Bible, we use it today. It's not just for the Jews, it's for believers. And we have the choice to make. Uh, I want to read for you Deuteronomy chapter 30. There was a choice that was given to the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 15. It says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good on one side, and death and evil on the other side. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways. Again, Moses speaking to the children of Israel. To keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, all synonyms for the word of God. That thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. He said, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish. Ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou go to possess over Jordan. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, he said to the people. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. There's a choice. Therefore choose life, he said that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, thou mayest obey his voice, thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. And so there was a choice. We have a choice. Warren Wiersbe said Jesus used a similar image when he spoke in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate. There was a straight gate and a wide gate. There was a narrow gate and a broad gate. He said, straight and narrow is the way which leads to life and few there be that find it. I know about you, but it seems to me Jesus was saying 
The best way to go is, in, is the narrow way. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to get to heaven. And we like to think everybody's going to heaven. Well, according to that, everybody's going this way, in the wide gate, but not in the narrow gate. I believe there are going to be more people in hell than in heaven. I don't like to say that. I, I don't rejoice in that. I believe fact. Whenever you see in the Bible talking about Jesus comparing the world to fields and to farms and seeds and planting and, and getting a crop and a harvest, it's always a small amount that hears and, and accepts and trusts the truth. Now, we're supposed to go out. We're not... I don't know who's going to accept Christ, who's not going to accept Christ. We're just commanded to go and do it. We're the messenger. It's up to the Lord. But we're to go. And so in Psalm 1, we see that choice. Blessed is the man. Verse 4, the ungodly are not so. He's not happy. He's not blessed. Psalm 1 is the major passageway. This is the beginning to the rest of the 149 Psalms here. Before entering into the other ones, we must stop at the door of Psalm 1. And make a decision. What? Walk in the Lord's way. Delight in His Word and meditate on His Word. It's one thing to be, I love the Bible, but you never read it. It's like me saying, I'm going to date Terry. I'm falling in love with her. Terry, I'll see you next year. I'm going to be busy for a year. I'm uh, going to have to hold out and wait. I get back 2020. We'll have our next date. What kind of a love would that be? What kind of relationship would that be? We love the Lord. Uh, I read my Bible, let's see, about 10 years ago is the last time I read my Bible. Come on! Uh, only by doing what it says here in Psalm 1, by walking in the way of the Lord, delighting in His Word, meditating on His Word, can we expect to have what they say is blessed or happy is the man. Four things we're going to look at. <laughs> we might get through half, and we'll do the other half when I get back. We're going to try to quit in about 10 minutes, all right? Number one, to have a happy or blessed life, separate from the wicked. We talk in our first Sunday of the month, we men and ladies separate, right? We talk about living a holy, separated life. Well, that's what he's talking about in the first verse. Look at it again, Psalm 1-1. Blessed or happy is the man that does what? That walks not. So people say, Christianity is so negative. Yeah, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Uh, uh, you, how can you make it anything but? It's a negative to kill people. He said, Blessed is the man that walketh not, what? In the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man, you could say, that doesn't stand in the way of sinners, and blessed or happy is the man that does not sit in the seat of the scornful. This is a uh, beloved psalm, Psalm 1. I mean, we used to sing like this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf fall, so shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I mean, this is a great psalm. Uh, our kids memorize this because we sang it over and over again. Great way to memorize scriptures. And here we meet one of the most urgent things in our lives. We want to be happy. You want to be blessed? Do these things. It's really simple. The Hebrew word for blessed here is plural. It means many happinesses, <laughs> abounding in blessings, experiencing the full measure of joy, peace, yes, and prosperity. Uh, I, we're not preaching a prosperity gospel here. I don't mean prosperity that you have all the material things that you want. Being happy and content in this life with what God's given us. Why would you not want to live in the realm of the blessed? Blessed is the man or woman that does these things. Who would say, eh, I don't care about that. I don't want to even look at that. I'm not interested in that. I know what will make me happy. No, you don't know. God knows. He made us. What we must do here in Psalm 1 to receive this favor and dwell in this blessed state. First, we must not associate with ungodly people. Three postures are described here. Don't walk, don't stand, and don't sit. 
<laughs> with different groups. This is used as a form of poetry, a poetic language. They represent the overall life choices and activities of the blessed individual. The one who doesn't do these, not be blessed, can't be happy. One commentator says these phrases describe three degrees of departure from God. <laughs> All right, three different levels of conformity to the world. What does Romans say? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, you want to be like the world? Don't do these things. <laughs> walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, and sit in the seat of the scornful if you want to have a miserable life. Let's look at them closely. First, we're not to walk, not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. God's blessing on us, blessed is the man, will not be ours when we walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk is the most frequently translated in the Old Testament as go. Go refers to our natural activity or movement, all right? It's used here. It applies to our behavior in life. Don't behave like the ungodly. The counsel means advice or guidance. It sometimes refers to purposes, plans, or schemes. Ungodly is translated as wicked, the opposite of righteous, and speaks of a person guilty, standing condemned before God. One commentator says that the root means loose. Those who have loosed themselves from God and fallen into evil. In this context, it is accurately understood people who have cast off the restraints of God's word. I don't want it. I don't want anybody telling me what to do, especially God. They've chosen to live according to their own sinful purposes rather than God's righteous command. All right? Not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, you know, the first thing when I was in Catholic school, believe it or not, there was an older boy than me. I think I was in the fifth grade. This kid was like in the eighth grade, ready to go to high school next, right? I forget his name, Anthony something. He said, hey, Frankie, I walk you home today. I walk you home, and he's older than me. And Hey, did you ever say this word? I can't mention the word here tonight. <laughs> it was a bad word. And I said, no, no, we, we, don't, we don't say that. My, my mom and my dad would be very upset with me if I said this word. He goes, blankety blank, and he said it. See that? Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> I was walking in the counsel of the ungodly. He uh, said, come on, say it. I said, no, I can't say it. I, I really don't want to say it. If you want to say it, good. Go ahead. But I'm not saying it. Come on. Are you scared? You little baby? You know, that kind of thing. Say it. I said, no, I don't want to say it. Why? Come on, say it. This guy for like 10 minutes. Come on, you sissy. Say it. Be a man. Do it. Listen to me. Say it. It feels good. Do it. I said it. I went home that day, got in the house. Blankety blank. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> I got instant uh, <laughs> penalty. Uh, I think my grandma, I told her my grandma never did anything bad to me. Never, except that time. Took the soap, blah, 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 and I was blowing bubbles out of my mouth. You know, I never said that again. I said, it was Anthony. He may, I don't care, Anthony. Anybody tells you, you never do anything like that. <laughs> Walking not in the counsel of the ungodly. You say, oh, well, you know, well, well, I, was my, I did it. I can't say he made you. The devil made you do it. No, I was wrong. I, I paid a price, and that was the end of that. Second, not only are we not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, we're not to stand in the way of sinners. That doesn't mean you stand in their way and block them. No, the word way means the road or the path that they're on. According to the Scripture, two ways exist. Righteousness leads to life everlasting. Wickedness always leads to death and destruction. No middle road. <laughs> there's no, well, maybe there's another way I can go and do both. No, you can't. It's either this way or that way. Sinners, those who referred to Guilty before God because of their disobedience. Stand in the way and the road of guilty, disobedient sinners. They miss the mark, that means, as defined by God's word. The sinner rebelliously lives outside of God's limits and willfully transgresses against God's law. I don't know if I should confess my sin before the public here on the microphone. Can you scratch that out, Scott? <laughs> no. <laughs> this path of disobedience by standing in the way of sinners of God's commands is the way of those who do not have a relationship with God. Its end is death 
and eternal separation in hell. If we desire to be like it says, blessed is the man, blessed of God, we will not stand in the way of sinners and go their way. As true followers of the Lord, we've chosen the way of life over the road to destruction. We're no longer traveling the fool's way. They should have a sign. God's way, eternal life down this road, this street. The fool. Anybody want to go there? <laughs> the, the end is bad. It's possible for us to stand in that road or to return for a visit to the way of sinners. If we return, we, re we depart from the blessed state of joy, peace, and contentment. The result is we will painfully experience, if we're saved, God's loving <laughs> but firm hand of discipline. So I, I can't lose my salvation. You know, a lot of people would say, hey, you believe once you're saved, you're always saved. I said, well, the Bible doesn't use those words. I believe in eternal life, everlasting life. Well, I, I, now you can go out and sin. These people in Hope Sound that I talk about a lot believe holiness, that they reach a state of sinless perfection. They believe that they never sin anymore. I said, you're sinning right now. You're lying. Come on. Who, we're human. Listen. The result of a Christian going down in the way of sinners is going to be God's, if you're, if you're saved now, God's your father, he's going to chastise you. He's going to bring you back as much as he can with his chastising but loving hand. You love your kids. Bible teaches you discipline them, not because you hate them. It says if you don't discipline them, you hate them. You love them and you love them and you want them to turn out to be a good people and godly, hopefully Christians, and, and use their lives to serve the Lord. And they need correction. They need it bad, all right? The way of sinners is the opposite of the blessed life. The opposite. Those who live sinful lives, they don't know lasting joy. You see these people, uh, TV and Hollywood, and they have all these nice things, and we think, well, they must be very happy. <laughs> From what I see, they're the most miserable people that you can tell, usually committing suicide, dying young, from a life of uh, wreck and ruin, and uh, just uh, unbelievable excess of living. They never and never will, without Christ, experience that lasting peace the peace that we have that passes all understanding. They can't even understand it because they don't have it. They're plagued with guilt because of their sin and the hurt they bring to those who love them, people who love people. that we. I, anybody that's a friend or a family member, and you're the same, I'm sure, that you know that's not saved, you, you beg them, you, you cry for them, you pray for them to trust Christ because they're on the road to destruction. Their sin often leads to an isolated, lonely life that's cut off from others. Habitual sinners are prone to substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, and everything else to numb their conscience and ease their pain. You know that. It's a fact. So we're not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We're not to stand in the way with sinners, go that way. And third, I'll try to finish on this tonight. We have a few more minutes left. Not to sit in the seat of the scornful. The scornful, we know those people. They're the ones who mock everything that's holy. They have no respect for God and his word. The Hebrew verb form here for the word literally means to make a mouth at the scornful, to make a mouth. Uh, their uh, scorners are marked by pride. They, they believe they elevate themselves above God, not, not with God, better than God and they defiantly disobey God's commands. The scorner here, it says, is one portrayed as what? Sitting. Picture this now. The scorner, arrogantly perched on his self-appointed throne, contemptuously sneering at God and jeering at all of us that try to walk the path of righteousness. He, he very haughtily, proudly looks down on those with a lifestyle like ours, he exists to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the scorner. If we desire to be blessed, and we do, we will not sit in his seat. We will not act arrogantly before God or others. We will not disregard God's commands. Instead, we will guard ourselves, amen, from being influenced by those who live in mockery of God's word. These people that say, well, you got to be tolerant. They are not tolerant of God and his word and Christians. Not at all. They're the most intolerant people that there are. 
here in Psalm 1-1, there's a path that if we allow can lead us and, and to the presence of God. We have God in our body. We have the Holy Spirit of God in our bodies, but it ends with heaven forever with God. However, this path here of the scorner leads to a life of sin and away from God. It begins with considering ungodly advice. It progresses to following the way of sinners. All right? Walk it not in the council, listening to ungodly advice, standing in the way of sinners by following their way, and it culminates with the attitude of the scorner, proud, persistent rebellion against God's Word. Sometimes when I watch these people, it's, it's sad because they don't realize how, how bad and the condition that they're in. They think they're doing the right thing, and, and uh, it's very sad. All the verbs in these statements here are in the Hebrew perfect tense. What it means is, those who are blessed have made a commitment to live in obedience to God. <laughs> a commitment that guides us for the rest of our lives. The journey of righteousness is walked day by day, moment by moment, consciously in the presence of God and in the power of His Spirit. What a life. What a life that is, the blessed life. We have it. This presentation of oneself to God as a living sacrifice is also given in the New Testament, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, to prevent us from straying um, like the man here, the ungodly who walked in the, way, in the counsel of the ungodly. He stood in the way of sinners, and he sat in the seat of the scornful. All right? That's point one. <laughs> There's other points in Psalm 1. We're not done with it yet. We're just getting started. I'll stop here because it's 7 o'clock, but let's pray and ask God to help us to understand there's so much. This, this study on Psalms is not going to take three months or six months. It's going to take a long time if we want to get dig into knowing more about God. God made himself a known. We're doing that in the morning in Sunday school. He revealed himself to us one of the ways through his word and through the Psalms, through these songs, these hard issues of life. We're going to find out the real, true character and we say we know the love of God. Do we really? Well, yeah, he gave his son, died on the cross. That showed the ultimate love. I know that. But there's so much more to know about the nature of God and the character of our God. And it's going to be great. I hope you can come Sunday night. I wish the church was full right now. Not to hear me, but to hear about knowing God and the true uh, character and, and love, the true love of God. Amen. Well, let's uh, pray. I, I hate to stop. I can go to midnight, but I know you don't want to stay here, and i got to pack for my trip. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for these uh, words that you inspired the psalmist to write. And blessed, happy is the man or woman that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Lord, we want to delight in you and in your word, and thank you. These words, these holy words, these inspired, inerrant, preserved words that you gave us so we can know more about you. We want to be closer to you. We want to, as we said, experiencing God in our last, last Sunday school lesson. We want to get an, an intimate relationship with you to have this blessed, happy life. Lord, thank you for the Christian life, for salvation, and most of all, Lord, we're looking forward to eternity with you. Help us to get to know you better here so we can see you face to face someday and say we we knew god from his word and his spirit here but now we see him face to face and everything that was said here is true so help us lord please help us to share this message with others help us to glorify you by bearing fruit give us a great week this week and bring us back together on wednesday for more of study of your word In jesus name we pray amen all god's people said <laughs> amen I can't wait to get back.